Thank you so much. Welcome to Make Em All Mexican, <laughs> the critically acclaimed exhibition of work by artist Linda Vallejo. I'm Charlene Villasenor Black, a professor in the Department of Art History, and I was really fortunate to be here when uh, Linda began the installation of the show and to get to watch her uh, putting it up. Uh, the referent images in this installation are instantly recognizable. Leonardo da Vinci's uh, Mona Lisa, Andy Warhol's iconic self-portrait, Caravaggio's Bacchus, uh, all staples of the art history survey course, which I'm actually teaching right now. The moment of easy identification slips away almost instantly, though, replaced by surprise, amusement, and puzzlement, as the sharp point of Vallejo's political message announces itself, perhaps even provoking for some a sense of outrage. And in that moment, that slide from recognition to surprise and disrecognition, the artist has made her point. Uh, the surprise she provokes points to the power, I think, of this show. The pieces resist easy readability. Are they funny? Are they political? Are they offensive? Many of the objects, such as the reworked collectibles, which you see in the vitrine outside, also evoke nostalgic memories. And these are the kind of objects found in many homes, uh, purposefully retrieved by Vallejo from yard sales and flea markets. The only difference between these newly remade objects and the original is the color of the figure's skin. By repainting them all as brown, Vallejo points out the ubiquity of whiteness, the normalization of whiteness, its elevation is the standard. And it makes me think of the changing demographics in the US and California and here at uh, UCLA. Latinos are currently the largest minority group in the US and poised to become the majority here in California. So what do we make of uh, the exhibition in this context and what does it mean for us here in Los Angeles? Uh, and with these questions, I'm honored to introduce to everyone here the artist Linda Vallejo, born in California. Her work's exhibited all around the world, and we're going to uh, talk uh, about her work. Uh, we're going to sit here and have a, a conversation, I think, and maybe start with some of those questions that we raised in the beginning, yeah. and then uh, <coughs> give people a chance at the end to talk to her. There'll be uh, a lovely reception down the hall and a chance to really engage with the artwork. So uh, join me in welcoming her. And We'll move it over here. Yeah. And, oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, um, I know, I did the same thing. Uh, don't forget that there's also a series of pieces in the hallway that I really want you to enjoy. Because a lot of people, when they came, they came right into the, into the salon and didn't check out the multiple sculptures outside. So please make sure that you get a chance to look at those before you go today. Do you want to start with some of those questions? Uh, yeah. are, are they political? Are they funny? Are they meant to be offensive? Or... Yeah. Do you want to? Mm -hmm. Yes. What are you thinking? How many people find the work uh, political, specifically? Raise your hands for me. How many people find them um, emotional? Yeah. Yeah. There, well, see, emotional has got the same got the same rank here. Oh, good. That's yeah. good. It's How many people find them offensive? Ah, oh, come on. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> good. We need at least one. How many people? I mean, I mean, I've had people laugh when they look at the work. I've had people cry when they look at the work. I've had people share lots of incredible old-time memories with me about the work, right? And to bear their souls in all kinds of ways. And uh, it happens again and again and again. So I think it isn't really about what I think about the work. I just had this crazy idea. <coughs> and this was an insane idea. Uh, and I went out and bought $3,000 worth of antiques and did it. I mean, it was insane, and I just did it. And my response is very autobiographical. There's a lot of me in this work. It's a lot about the way I feel about myself as a brown person. But the real value of the work is the response that other people get, how they feel about it, what it makes them think about, what the audience feels about it, what, I mean, what the nation thinks about the mm -hmm. idea of making them all brown. Mm -hmm. By the way, LA County is 48.3% Latino. Wow. I don't know whether you knew that or not. Yeah. I thought it was like the state, which was like 35%. 48.3% pretty much floored me. I was pretty flabbergasted. I'm teaching the art history survey in the department right now. It's a giant general education course that looks at Renaissance and Baroque art in Europe and the Americas. And so I was really shocked by the images that I saw. And, and it was very poignant for me 
as a Chicana, but also trained as an art historian in this discipline where the most important canonical artworks, what we've decided are the masterpieces of my field, are about whiteness or about Europeanness. And so seeing your remaking of these images for me was very touching. Mm -hmm. um, and I see some of my students here, so happy. Oh, that's to, good. Thank you for coming. Have, have them here. Um, well, you know, when you're out in uh, secondhand stores and uh, what, uh, antique malls, and by the way, I've been to every antique mall in Southern California at this point, <laughs> you begin to realize what's collected by Americana. You begin to see what's actually in people's homes. And if it's 48.3% Latino, what you're seeing is collected by Latinos as well. And what I've, one of the images that you will, if you go out and actually make a study of it and actually take notes, like do a, a historical kind of a stu studious thing about it, you'll see a uh, uh, blue boy, Game Bros blue boy, hmm. over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. That is really one of the forms of, a, that is true Americana. It's kind of like what, uh, what Frida Kahlo is to the Chicanos, blue boy is to Americana. It's really an interesting thing. And so when you go out and you're buying these things and you're looking for things, suddenly you begin to realize that there aren't any Mexican, there's no brown images out there. There's no brown images. If you find a brown image, it's what's a little salt pepper shaker of a little Indian, right? Or, you know, and even, the, even if you find the vaquero, which I did, I found a beautiful vaquero. It was done in like that cracked porcelain from the 1960s, mm. right? You don't see brown images. You don't see those kinds of images. So it just dawned on me, well, gee, you know, why don't I make them brown? Let's make them brown. There's something very nostalgic in those works too, I and mean, they they look I don't know they look like maybe from the 70s or um, that my childhood. Thinking about uh -huh. them, thinking about those are the kinds of things that I saw growing up and revisioning them as as brown was a powerful moment uh, for me. But how do you select these things when you're out looking around? Well, after a while, you begin seeing a lot of repetition. You see the same image over and over and over again, and you know what a good image looks like. You know, like, this is a really good example of this image. This is the best I've ever seen. And after a while, you begin to see all kinds of repetitions over and over and over again, and you don't really have that many choices. Like, people will say, well, why don't you do Frank Sinatra? I go, fine, go find him. I'll do him. Just go find him. I gotta find him. I can't do Frank unless you find him for me. And I don't think I've ever seen a figurine of Frank. Uh huh. Think about it for a second. When you think about figurines, a lot of what you see is what the Greek gods, the Roman gods. You can find a lot of Egyptian stuff. There's a lot of Egyptian stuff out there, and there's a lot of what these little sort of French porcelains, German and uh, English porcelains, and even. Uh, Latin American families collected in the in the what the 40s and the 50s. My grandmother had the little the little tchotchkes of the Cinderella things and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But when you think about what you see out there, it's really not a lot. Mm -hmm. And the religious images, of course, I noticed because of my own research interests. The, yeah, the yeah. Pieta. The, yeah. I showed that to my students. They were oh. they, they tittered, sort of nervously laughed. Like, is it okay to laugh? Or yeah, it's okay to laugh. Please laugh. If you laugh, that means you're getting it. Uh -huh. If you laugh, that means you're willing to walk through this doorway with me and talk about the politics of color and the politics of class mm -hmm. and the politics of privilege, the politics of what access. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to laugh, you can get through this door. But if you have like a you know like a lot of anger, the door is shut to you, right? You end up kind of stuck in the in the sort of in the past with the anger thing. If you can laugh about it, you're on your way to healing, you know, mm -hmm. to a healing about this and being able to not take yourself so seriously, maybe even like your brownness. Mm. <laughs> Brown is beautiful, man. <laughs> hey. Amen. So, like these images here, the Mona Lisa mm -hmm. and uh, Botticelli's Venus and the Bacchus, um, <clears throat> you can only buy JPEG images of certain things that have to be 70 years old. You can only buy those JPEGs. You can't, you can steal them off of the internet, which I did with the Andy Warhol. I stole that. Because uh -huh. I'm appropriating, right? I'm taking it back, if you will, right? Let's take it all. <laughs> you know, that's sort of, sort of an indigenous thing to talk about, right? Let's take it. <laughs> okay, you want to take it? I'm going to take it right back. <laughs> and so I, I didn't really have a choice about what I could do in terms of classics because there's only certain num of numbers of images that are available to me. Mm -hmm. So I had to purchase the JPEGs and then I had to, you know, go through the process of figuring out how to change them so that they're, the girls are, you know, have dark hair and dark skin. and. Uh, uh, Mona Lisa has those funny eyebrows. <laughs> 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 I couldn't help it. 
<laughs> and these little ones over here are actually antique postcards, and they're some of my favorites. And I hope that you'll take yeah. a chance to look at them. You can imagine you go to the antique malls and you find the little antique postcard places. But you know, like you have like the little um, flags of all nations in the center with the little girl surrounded by the American flags and the pride <coughs> of being an American and the joy of Americana. You know, the whole. I'm proud to be an American. You know, I'm very. I, I you know, I'm fourth generation Californian. I, I love being an American. It's very important to me when I travel, wherever I travel, I, you know, I'm an American. And so to have a, the little girl surrounded by these things in an antique postcard from the turn of the century, uh, painted with black hair and dark mm -hmm. skin like me, mm -hmm. it made me feel so happy and proud. Mm -hmm. Have people been offended or uh, discussed their reactions with you at all? Or? Oh, heck yeah, they come right at me. <laughs> uh, one person looked right at me and said, do you want to be white? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this was like, I said, yes, I do. <laughs> of course I did, right? What am I going to say? I wasn't going to break into tears or anything like that. I said, yes, I do. I want the access. I want the privilege. I want the money. I want the power. I want it all. <laughs> <laughs> and I want it now. I have a question. Do you want to be Andy Warhol? Because I thought of that oh, image as yeah. like your avatar in a funny way. You know, when we were hanging that up in here, I can't remember who we were talking to, but I said, "Can this is how this is how you look at it, right? Can you imagine, okay, if Andy Warhol had been a Mexican, <laughs> and what that would have meant to the art world?" and what that would have meant to the sales of Mexican-American artwork and Chicano artwork. I mean, it's just sort of like mind-blowing when you think about it, you know? And if we had a Warhol, who would it be, right? And all of a sudden, the conversation, then you begin to understand, what if Marilyn Monroe was actually Mexican? If she was brown, the whole context for what? Beauty, yeah. right? Uh, all this stuff would just be it would acting be, in Hollywood. It, what yeah. would just be on its head? Yeah, the whole thing would be on its head. Yeah. Let's turn it upside down. Any other responses you want to just talk about? Why do you or? make them so dark? Oh, was that coming from Latinos? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Why do you make them so dark? We're not that dark. Why do you make them so dark? I'm not that dark. <laughs> So the only thing I can come back with is a good joke. I like them short and dark. What are you going to do? <laughs> I love it. It's so rude. I it's, a, it. it's a good joke, though, right? I like them short and dark. What are you going to do? And all the guys that were short and dark go, ah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thank God somebody likes the short and dark guys, right? <laughs> you know? And you know, what are you going to do? I mean, I, 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 like them, I like them short and dark. What are you going to do? I, I, can't, I don't have any excuse for it. But then, you know, like one of the conversations that came up was that when I was born, I was very fair. And as I got older, I got darker and darker. And I could feel the love of my family ebbing away. <laughs> A Latin American actually said that. I mean, this is intense. So why do you make them so dark comes actually from within, inside, within Latino culture, Mexican culture itself. Yeah. It's not something that's outside. It's not one culture against another. It's one yeah. culture against itself. Our own internalized attitudes about Well, this. not only that, I mean, well, it's, you know, younger girls have access to education and access to better marriage opportunities, where no matter what race you are. Mm -hmm. Fairer girls, lighter haired, lighter eyed girls have access to more privileges all over the world. A girl, I mean, everybody's like shaking their heads, but they're very, everybody's being very quiet. Mm -hmm. Do we want to invite maybe some comments from the audience or? Oh, yes. Yeah. As you were saying, it goes back to the culture. My grandmother was born in Zacatecas, and she was the dark one of the family. Uh, everybody else was fair-skinned. Um, they gave her to her grandmother, didn't want her. Yeah, she became her grandmother's her. sort of helper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take care of the children, yeah. stay at home, don't get educated. Yeah. And my grandmother, my mother and my aunt, my mother's fair complexed. my aunt looks my, my brownness, mm -hmm. and my aunt was the one that always had to do the work, and my mother got away with everything, was spoiled. Spoiled fair girl. Yeah. Did she marry well? No, unfortunately. No. That's too bad. She lost her chance. Yeah. <laughs> Although my stepfather used to call her Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I mean, you only have so many chances. You know, what's come to me about this whole thing is that, you know, I'm pretty dark. I, in Mexico, I'm Juanita, but here I'm, I'm a dark girl. And I never dawned on me that I was. <laughs> it never dawned on me that it mattered. Because it didn't matter to me. 
And now all of a sudden, it, I realize that it does matter, and it matters to a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. You know, I want to tattoo my income on my forehead <laughs> yeah. so that people will treat me right. <laughs> Another question. Other comments or questions? Or Ask me anything. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. What was your first, when you got the idea, the first reaction? I mean, that that is such a bravery, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do that. I, I remember one time I was looking for a little statue for my daughter's first birthday and everything was a little brown precious moments a little blonde well I, I had to daughter her daughter do her hair dark and they said well, why'd you do it it's a collectible well but it didn't represent my daughter oh that's nice congratulations yesterday I found this really nice uh, a, a Valentine's Day card for my husband that just says I love being with you oh, and I like hanging out sweet. and you know going it's just one of those really nice kind of relationship kind of cards rather than you're the love of my life and I'll die for you and all that stuff it's more like you know you're cozy and I like being with you and the, 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 the photograph on the front is a girl sitting on a guy's lap but all you see is them from the waist down and she has a skirt on with he heels and, and you can see her legs and, the, and her hands her hands are like on her husband's you know on her husband's knee and, and I thought, that, so before I give it to my husband, I'm going to go and I'm going to color her <laughs> I have to. It just made so much sense. So I was traveling nationally teaching grant writing. That's what I do for a living is I grant write. I'm a development person. And uh, I had a great opportunity to teach nationally. Uh, both of my sons were in, uh, one was in UCLA, one was in UC Santa Cruz. And anybody who has kids that have been in college, you know you need extra income. All of a sudden, you need extra income, right? So I had this opportunity to travel to teach, and so I got to go to a lot of major cities in the United States. I was in Chicago, Dallas, Detroit, Miami, D.C., New York several times, uh, all over. And uh, I was there for four days to teach the class. And I had Tuesday nights free. Class ended at 4 o'clock, and I had an hour to get someplace, sometimes two hours to get somewhere. And I made it a real uh, uh, job to go to any gallery, any museum I could get to within the context of that time. And in some of the major cities, like New York, I would stay an extra couple of days and do the museums. Pittsburgh, I love the melon. And um, sometimes even in my classes, there would be someone who worked at a museum and I'd get like free passes into the museums. So I got to see work from all over the world. All over the world, just from everywhere. And that excites me more than anything because that's where our idea can come from. That's where a real idea can begin, really percolating, when you see a really broad spectrum of statement and idea. So as I was traveling a great deal, I saw all this work of repurpose. It was all this repurpose work. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I went, they were either repurposing trash, they were repurposing mm -hmm. photographs, they were repurposing newspaper, they were repurposing all kinds of objects, mm -hmm. beautiful, beautiful. They were re one of my favorite ones was repurposing uh, uh, clothes hangers, the most be one of the most beautiful sculptures I've ever seen. And I noticed that it was a, this giant trend to repurpose objects. And I, uh, what I do in my artistic process is I ask questions and then I respond with a, I, I ask a question and I say, I wonder what that would look like. That's what I say to myself. I ask a question, I say, I wonder what that would look like. That would look, you ask a question, you say, what, uh, what does the object look like? It's a, a strange sort of uh, process that only an artist can understand, where you're actually looking for a physical object to answer a question. So I, my question was, what would a repurposed object look like from mm. my personal point of view? Did you start with the collectibles, like the figurines? Is that where you started? No, I started, I, I, it, it, for, I spent about three years doing all different kinds of repurposed objects using architectural things that I had found. I also went to Florence and Rome during this mm. time. And I, I went to China during this time. I mean, I was really looking at this repurposing question. What would I use and how would it look like? And I started uh, doing a series of, uh, I started using photographs in some of my work. I started doing, I did, a, I did an installation called A Prayer for the Earth, and I had this giant mandala with photographs and three-dimensional objects. I did a series called Thugs and Hoes based on sexuality, which was uh, this whole repurposing of Grecian uh, uh, vases with paintings of uh, the uh, what the sexy you know what the Superman and the sexy girls it was really f I was trying I was still trying to be funny <laughs> see how far I get and so one day I was traveling through the mall looking for stuff 
just sort of wandering around looking for this image. And I was going through the photograph section, and at, by this time I was also collecting newspapers and collecting magazine sheets. I was just, just collecting, sort of one, just spending money without reason, the thing my husband hates me for. <laughs> Always art objects, I'm buying art supplies. And I saw uh, the primer, I saw the pages from the Dick and Jane book. Um, right. Okay. I, I've never seen those book pages again. In all the time that I've spent doing this, it's been three over three years, I've never seen them again, and I've tried to find them again. And they're, how many people grew up with Dick and Jane? I got yeah. that story somehow. Oh, uh, you find it. You find it. I'll trade you for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, there was, they were torn pages from the book. They were, they were expensive. I couldn't believe it, but now I can understand why they were so expensive, because they're not that easy to find. Mm -hmm. And I looked at them, and I went into shock, and I said an explicative, you know, literally you don't get, oh, eh, I could make, I could paint them brown. Oh my God in heaven, help me. I could paint them brown. <clears throat> oh my God, help me. I could paint them. And I just kind of went into shock. And so I bought them immediately. And then I bought a whole bunch of others. The, the examples of the books outside that you'll see in the cabinets, there's a couple of books out there that you can see. I started buying postcards and um, Armando actually saw the Dick and Jane piece and uh, purchased it on the spot because Armando has this ability to see the, the, the initial object. He has this ability to see the initial object. He's very good at it. And the pinnacle, the pinnacle initial object. And um, then one day I was looking again after I started going nuts and making everything brown. I mean, there you are with a Q-tip. Right, and then changing people's noses and giving them all upper, upper, bigger upper lips. You know, because most people, you know, other cultures don't have big upper lips like ours because it's big upper lips. It's very sexy. Up there. <laughs> a little, little mustache for the girls and the boys too. Right? With the archy eyebrows. So there you are with a Q-tip, right? And you know, a lot of things come to your mind. You know, all, all, the only difference between us is a, a little Q-tip. But that's the only difference. It's just a little Q-tip. This is all it is. Q tip. So I was going to the stores again, and one day I saw these ridiculous little salt and pepper shakers, which I still have, and they're the uh, um, uh, they were uh, the pilgrims, and I said that's messed up. <laughs> that is really messed up. I like that. Mm -hmm. Let's turn it upside down and make Thanksgiving brown. And good God bless America, it should be brown. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm getting all I'm getting all pissed off about it, right? So. So then the sculpt that's when the sculpture took off and that's how it all started. Yeah. Then I just kinda went nuts from there. <laughs> are you done with it? Are you still producing work in this mode? Or I know you're working on some new things too. Yeah. I'm very excited. It's still brown. And I've come up with a new way to um, the way that I'm describing it is I've come up with an elegant solution to a complex set of questions. And the result is a minimalist. It's minimalist. I'm very, very excited about it. It's it's so simple that <coughs> it's kind of like I could have had a V8. <laughs> you know, it's so simple that you wouldn't think of it. It's so simple, and yet it's got it's like the figurines in the books. It has multiple levels and layers that bring out all different kinds of conversations and interesting uh, comments and in insights. It's all based on Latino data, like demographic data, mm -hmm. or what? Do you, what kinds of data? Demographic data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited. Very excited. But I'm not gonna. I'm not going to uh, um, lower the boom until I lower the boom, and when I lower the boom, I'll let you know. <laughs> Hopefully, we can see it again. Oh, you will. Yeah. So somebody else got another question for us up here. I dare you. <laughs> Go for it. I'm trying to grasp what it is that you have uh, become very aware of. It's, it's your personal journey through the art of, of various cultures from around the world. So you have become uh, not only a connoisseur, but, but also something <coughs> revelation is what I'm... Do you have that in some sort of a compendium or a book or something that we can look at? You mean in terms of the revelation? 
Yeah. No, I've never really talked about the revelation. But you understand what I'm... I do. Tr trying to... It's, it's, it's the work put together so we can share your revelation. Well... When you get there. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, you know, when, you, when I first began <clears throat> picking the little statuettes and stuff, I really... You know, art, as an artist, you really can't envision... You can't envision the image construct the image and complete the image with expectation of a specific of a specific final result because if you do a lot of times you'll steer yourself in the wrong way you have to have this willingness to envision it construct it because you have to construct the things I mean they have you have, you have to figure out how to do it it's like how do I make a 10 layer cake you don't just start throwing a 10 layer cake together you literally have to read recipes and buy supplies and maybe even do some practice sessions and maybe you'll make one that's not so great and one you'll make that's really good and one you'll make that's like the best one. I mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And then the final result, a lot of times is as much a shocker to me as it is to the audiences that I share it with. And that's the good part about it. Because if you knew exactly what it was as you were going along the revelation, as you talk about, if you knew the revelation before you completed the object, why would you complete the object? No, that's the, the process toward that's right. your enlightened uh, consciousness about what you have discovered. And I'm still discovering it. And that's how come I keep asking you to ask me questions. Because I discover it based on what you tell me and the questions that you ask me about the work. Uh, granted, in the last three years, I've had what do you figure, maybe ten talks, and the and the questions are are they repeat? Some of the questions repeat themselves. You, on the other hand, have asked a question that no one's asked before. Uh, the revelation of this work is I dream about the revelation of this work. I cry about the revelation of this work. I'm angry sometimes. I'm confused sometimes. I'm, 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 I'm blustered sometimes. You know, sometimes I want to come out, you know, boxing. Sometimes I, I'm, I'm proud and pleased and uplifted by the work. It just, it, it, for me, it's because it's biographical, it's autobiographical. I mean, if you read the little article that I wrote for the beautiful Aslan Journal that I'm so proud to be a part of, there's a copy of it outside as well. I, I, uh, Sean was kind enough to allow me to write my biography in it, or a short statement of my upbringing is what I should say. And it tells you how I was brought up. I mean, I went to middle school in Montgomery, Alabama. Before that, I didn't know I had a color. You know? And suffering through questions of race and what the politics of color and the politics of class and access, which is a really big thing, access. The rules of engagement are different for people of color. The rules of engagement in the world are different, and I think we get them confused a lot of times. I mean, there's so many questions that come up, and the revelations for me are very deep, and my hope is that the revelations are as deep for the viewer, and the collector, and the connoisseur, and the student, right, and the historian, right, as they are for me. I'm struck by the complexity of your engagement with this notion of America yeah. and looking at these postcards here, but also the dolls that are outside. Oh, you mean the 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 uh, the print the print the, the presidents and the, yeah, oh, they're so cute, aren't they cute? And and so to hear cute. you say you're proud to be American and uh, to yet have these critiques uh, here. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? I, what I like about your work is it's not an easy read, right? There are layers to it and. Pro they're profound things and deep things. Well, you know, I found the dolls in this this mall in Pomona. There's this giant mall in Pomona on Second Street. Y'all been out there? Mm -hmm. It's a huge mall out there. It's a, there must be what eight to ten stores, and some of them have those multiple uh, floors. And I go out there a lot, and I have to make myself not go out there because now it's become an addiction. Because <laughs> uh, I've got to make it all Mexican. The all's becoming. So I, I don't go. I can't go in there. No, I can't. I won't go in there. I just won't go in there. <laughs> No, no, please don't make me go in there. And I still find myself in there. And I found these dolls, and they were so beautiful, but they were just cloth bodies, stuffed, beautiful handmade stuffed cloth bodies with these fabulous porcelain heads and arms and feet. And they were on the little doll racks, and with them, 
came the patterns for the dresses and the clothing. I think they were, um, I think the dolls were $100 a pair. And I said, I gotta have these things. This is just too crazy. So it really wasn't me saying, I'm gonna go out and find the presidents because yeah, I wanna do a political critique. Yeah. It isn't like that. It doesn't function like that. It's like, I gotta make everything brown. Oh my God, look at these dolls. Let's buy these. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're the presidents. Isn't that funny? That's, that's really messed up. Let's do that. That's really messed up. Mm -hmm. So we, I bought them. And we painted them brown, and then we spent so much time making the clothes. Oh, you God. have to look at the clothes if you haven't mm -hmm. seen. We had to them make up. those yeah. clothes. We had to we had to like go to like doll clothes stores and buy like material that had like little itty bitty flowers rather than you know the big flowers like this and the little clothes. We had to buy the little buttons that were like the size of I don't know what, like the center of your eye. And it took us like three months to make those clothes. It was like this labor of love, and of course they're worth it all. I really like those guys a yeah. lot. I think they're pretty funny. I think they're pretty funny mm -hmm. and pretty poignant, like you say. Yeah, they're very poignant. They're very poignant. Yeah. The work's all so you. It, it's very funny, but it's very political, right? It, it's, yeah. Well, it's political, it's personal, it's, you know, it has a lot of layers. There's, what I like about the work is that some people do find it political, some people find it really funny. Like my mother, who is the short, dark Mexican in my family, just thinks it's the funniest thing this side of, I don't know what, Texas. She can't stop laughing. She goes to stores and buys me things. Ooh, make this proud. <laughs> make this one proud too. Ah! She loves it. She can't stop laughing about it. And she's the darkest one. I think that maybe that, I think I might have just given myself a reason. She likes them dark and short too, just like me, because that's the way she is. Another question or, come on. Yeah, stand up, we can't see you. Whoa. Yeah, we can't see you, Vicky. Yeah. Uh, is there anything uh, that's taboo to you? Um, that's too Americana to make brown, or like maybe it. the Uncle yeah. Sam poster, or something that you will no. not do that, or do you just no, 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 there's not. Great, there's not. That's nothing. what I wanted to hear. No, there's <laughs> not. There's and the reason, nothing. you know, for that is, see, I grew up in Orange County, and uh, I was born at the General Hospital, but I was raised in Orange County, and uh, for all intents and purposes, all my girlfriends were surfer girls, all my buddies were long-haired, blue-eyed surfers. I married one of those guys. Hey, I <laughs> thought I was white, <laughs> till, till. I went to USC to play football, and they reminded me that I had a brown nut. <laughs> and I just, you know, I, I, I love your stuff. I love it. Which it's one do you like the best? All of them. Oh, all of them. <laughs> you want me to do the, you want me to do Just the, in their face. We're man. looking for you. Oh, yeah. No, it just, you know, Enjoy just the in one. their face. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Brown nalgas. That's a funny one. <laughs> yeah. I should do some brown nalgas. <laughs> 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 Other reactions? Uh, my, with, yes. On, on the surface, I don't see this as angry work at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny. Uh, it's, it's got a soft touch. And uh, I, I appreciate that very much because it, it certainly in, invites me to look at it and look at it for a long time because it's not screaming and it's not gnashing its teeth and it's not, you know, La Raza, you know. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. it's just, yeah. But, um, it also leads me to, from that soft touch, it also leads me to think that there's a feminine aspect mm -hmm. to this work mm -hmm. because in the 30s, 40s, the 50s, and everything before, uh, it was sort of the woman's role to decorate the home, and you have chosen decorations. Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm seeing that as part of the soft touch, mm -hmm. you know, that, so uh, do you have, have you ever thought of that? No. But I ha what I have thought of is that uh, one of the subcultures of Latinismo is the segunda, the secondhand store. It's a huge subculture. It's, I think it's because you know when you come from working class and working poor, a lot of what you get is from the secondhand store. Mm -hmm. So what you find is like these opportunities to decorate and to make a home, to, to nest from things that you find in the secondhand store. And I think that those two things together, kind of, you know, the nesting, the home, making beautiful objects, pretty little tchotchkes, pretty little things. How many of you agree with that, that it has a feminine side? What would you say about that? Yeah. What would you say about that? Well, yeah. I, I, I think I told you from the beginning uh, when you started doing the porcelain pieces, that they reminded me of my aunt. I had an aunt 
who had a, that kind of stuff in her house in Ciudad Juarez, and it reminded me very much of that. And uh, and of course, the difference was the brown, brown face, you know. But I I saw them all as uh, as you know very feminine, because uh, I remember going to her house. We couldn't touch anything, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we couldn't move around too much because she had all the stuff, you know, the, all these French porcelain stuff. Uh, which is why I really liked uh, when you had that, that show with the retreat, mm -hmm. the whole, I mean, it was all a big setup. Yeah, the giant uh, retreat. Uh, and yeah, beautiful. <clears throat> it was just kind of like, but now it's like my aunt's retreat, except now they're all brown. They're all know? brown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when you say that, really, though, I do think of my grandmother, too. Because she had, remember, we were looking for those at some of the second answers, uh, the, those mirrored, those mirror, the framed mirrors. Anybody mm -hmm. remember those framed mm -hmm. mirrors with the little shelves in them? Right. But well, she had one of those, remember? Oh, yeah. And there was all these like little figurines all over yeah. and stuff. I think many of us have memories mm -hmm. of grandmas, regardless of where we're from, right? We have memories of these things. So I think that the feminine aspect of it comes from the me my memory of the women in my family. That's what I, that's, that's the first thing that comes to my, I mean, if we're going to do therapy here, that's the first thing that comes <laughs> to my mind. Yeah, I really like that observation. I hadn't thought about that, but it's women who are curating these figurines in, in our homes, right? Right. The, the religious images, the the dolls, the right framed images. Yeah. But taking it one step I further and making it hers. The, uh, you know, your choice of the, the movie stuff and the television shows and the, and the primaries and things like that, you know, I mean, both gender share yeah. those things. Well, even the old movies is a really Latino thing, too. Old mm -hmm. movies mm -hmm. is a really Latino thing, too. A lot of people are addicted to old movies. Mm -hmm. I'm really addicted to old movies. It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. It's just terrifying. That's why I do all the movie stars, too. That's interesting. But then we're getting into the autobiographical aspects of the work. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think a lot, but as Latinos, I think we share a lot of these together, which is an interesting aspect, too. Any further thoughts or comments, reactions? Oh, yeah. um, I wonder if you could just speak more about the, the British <coughs> monarchs, because those were, of, of all the pieces I've seen so far, I think that, like, the Queen Mother portrait, to me, that was the funniest. And I think it's because I was having a conversation with my friend about it. It's kind of like, I mean, the, the, the Queen Mother, you know, in England, I, I, I don't know, it's like the epitome of whiteness. Uh -huh. And so to see, see with brown skin, it's just, I don't know, I was just wondering if you could just talk more about that. It's my favorite piece. I mean, that's my personal piece. That piece is actually not available. You can't have that piece. It's my piece. You know, and that's, that's not a lot of pieces I say that about. I, I don't say that about very many pieces at all because, you know, I, I have 200 of these works all told. Wow. Including really large sculptures as well. You can see on some of them on the, on the, uh, uh, the television that's outside with the slideshow running on it, right? But this I have this, I have a fetish for the queen. <laughs> no pun intended, right? I think a lot of Americans have a fetish for the queen. You know, the monarchy. A lot of Americans. I mean, we they're all over the tabloids all the time, you know. The what Diana's death became like some like she was our princess and she had died, she was everywhere, right? Yeah. All of their marital problems and all this stuff become fodder for I don't know what magazines. We have this fetish for the queen, and I am no different than any other American. I have a fetish for the queen, too. And I was uh, collecting magazines, and I don't know, I can't remember what's on the back of that. I think it was a, a cigarette ad or a, or a liquor ad that I was doing for one of the books. And I had been saving, because I bought these big stack of Life magazines at some secondhand store in the middle of nowhere. And I brought them home, and I had te was tearing out the pages. And I had uh, the cigarette ad down on the table, and I was getting ready to you know, work with it and make it brown and put it into a book that I was preparing. And for some reason, I, I might have picked it up or something, I looked through it, and I saw that it was a queen on the other side. And I flipped it over, and it was this full image of the Queen Mother. And um, I always, I love my, I love my grandmother a great deal. I love my great grand. I had four great grandparents when I was eighteen years old. Uh, that's why I'm so cocky, because I was surrounded by family and love for a very long time, and I'm the oldest girl on both sides. 
So I was everybody's little princess, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so uh, that's why I'm so cocky. That's why I'm just, I'm indomitable because I just have all this love as a little girl. So I love my grandmothers. I love the image of my grandmother. And I, uh, I love the idea of taking, because this actually looks like my grandmother by the time I'm done with it. I changed her nose, I gave her the upper lip. I, I did, I changed her nose, I made her a little bit more, you know, more prominent nose, really beautiful prominent nose. But I always wanted to place my grandmother, you know, give, allow her to be dripping in emeralds and diamonds with a tiara and ermine and sitting in a, in a, in a beautiful castle with a fabulous floral arrangement and everything by her. It just to me, it's just fabulous. Mm -hmm. And the idea of, uh, to me, it's just like a dream come true. Mm -hmm. the, to the idea that we could um, honor brown grandmothers, if you will, to, cat, to make a catchphrase, to me, it's just really, really a fabulous thing. I mean, think of it for a minute. Think of your own grandmother and how you feel about her, right? And imagine her dripping in emeralds and diamonds and ermine. I mean, I, I, I cried when I saw it. And I thought, oh, there she is. Oh, look how beautiful she looks. So that, to me, is really, really important. But I have this whole thing about the monarchy. I think it's really kind of good. Yeah, Mike. Uh, you're about to go into the land of sadness. Uh, with the work, that you didn't see yourself in what was available uh, to buy or available to emulate, mm -hmm. and this is uh, this was one of the things that you talked to me about that I thought, oh my God, you know, that's that's really true. If you don't see yourself in in the popular culture, what do you do? How lonely that is. How sad. You know, so. Well, you know, I, the joke I used to get out of that one is I thought I was an ugly white girl till I was 25 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that could be the title of a book, what you was, know. What was, what was the I met a white boy that thought I was cute. Because <laughs> I, I was surrounded by non-Latinos for most of my life. Until I was 25 years old and I came back and sort of took a nosedive into Chicanismo. Just this total nosedive. Um, because I couldn't help it, but yeah, I mean, you know, you don't really know. I mean, you don't. If you're looking, if you look outside of yourself to see who you are, that's really not a very good thing, anyway. I mean, psychologically, what rev from rev from the revelation point of view, it's not such a great idea to look outside of yourself for what verification or you know what I mean, uh, love and all this stuff. I mean, you can't, you just can't do this. You have to be able to look inside, what they say is turn the mirror in and look inside yourself and see who you are. So you can imagine the complexities and the confusion of looking into media or looking into your surroundings. Imagine Montgomery, Alabama, looking outside and not seeing anyone who looks like you, who talks like you, who thinks like you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it can be very difficult, especially for young people. And I think it's a topic that's worth discussing because we have a lot of young people, I'm sure you know many of the professors and uh, people involved in the university here, have young people in their in their uh, classes that have difficulty finding out who they are or what they want to do or what's the best path for them in their life or what makes the most sense for them and it's kind of difficult when there's you know there's I mean, I mean what what's the percentage of lawyers in California this is some of the data I'd like to find out Latin American lawyers what's the percentage of Latin American doctors or uh, what physicians or these kinds of things. So, it, it, you know, finding that kind of opportunity to see yourself out there in a positive way uh, can make a big difference. It is one of the problems we're facing at UCLA, right? That we, the student body, uh, undergraduate student body, I think is maybe 27% uh, white, but the faculty is 75% white. So we have an increasingly diverse undergraduate student body, uh -huh. but the faculty is not diverse. So it is something that faculty and students are are thinking about right now at UCLA, really, yeah. Well, so so you can include that data. In yeah, make them all Mexican even touches on that topic. Your piece. <laughs> May, uh, any last words or uh, any last comments? There's a wonderful reception down the hall. Uh, you can also take some time to uh, talk with Linda or maybe look oh, at yeah. the artworks. Yeah. Do you have any last uh, words, Linda, or can we take a last question maybe? The last question back there. Sorry, I have a question. Um, Good. No, don't I was apologize. wondering if you can talk about your, um, to what extent the role that your mother, as a mother, uh -huh. 
of children who are half white and half Mexican, how yeah. that influenced your work, whether you saw um, whether you saw the need for more brown images for your children. So you don't think that your, your role as a mother changed your desire to see more diversity? I don't think so. Um, I'm, I'm very selfish. And if I have an idea, I don't really care who it's for, who it's not for. I just have an idea and I follow it. I'm very selfish when it comes to work. I have to cook and clean and make a living and help my children with in college and graduate school and their weddings and all this stuff. I mean, as a mother, you give and 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 you give. And when it comes to my art, it's like, I don't really give a damn. I'm going to do what I want to do and I don't really care. Like people will say to me, well, I don't really like this work over here as much as I like this work over here. And they're always afraid that I'm offended. And in my head, I'm thinking, well, I'm glad you like this work, but it's not going to stop me from doing this other work. I mean, I do what I want to do, and that's why I make art. I make art to express myself and to discover questions and answers and ideas. I mean, that's what I live for. I, I kind of consider myself sort of a poet philosopher. And my children <coughs> were actually brought up in indigenous America. My children are more Chicano indígena as half white, half Mexicans than they are Chicanos, they function more in the indigenous community, which is really outlandish. So their res their response to themselves as people of color is really la pura chicanala that a lot of people don't even know about or haven't even gone there. And uh, they're stronger than I am by a, a thousand percent. I have a lawyer and a doctor. They kick it, man. They go out there and kick it. They're about six foot and they can pass for white. And I tell them, I told them when they went out to the real world, I said, if you can pass for a white, go right ahead and do it. Nobody needs to know your business. They don't need to know about any of it. If that's what gets you there, you go there. And it'll be okay. Because I know who you are, and you know who you are, and it's all good. And on several occasions, when I go finally to the meeting of the blah, 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 the doctors or this or the other, and he goes, I'd like you to meet my mom. You can just see their face is falling right off of a boom. Oh, my God, you're brown. <laughs> one, one, of, one of his friends actually said that to me the other night. We went to a party. He goes, oh, he's Mexican? <laughs> you know, and so it's like this. I said, you know, it's none of their business. It really isn't any of their business. You're... Their business is to, to look at you for the quality of your capacity. Mm -hmm. As a human being, that's what their job is. Not to judge you because you're this or you're that, or you're not this, or you're not that, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the art, I'm extremely selfish. And you know, I can, I'm not going to make excuses for it. I think if you're an artist, that's just what you do. You just make the image you got to make. Mm -hmm. And maybe your kids like it, maybe your kids don't. Maybe your kids are included, and maybe they're not. <laughs> They both like them, though. I got I have some doctors I got for my doctor son. <laughs> with one of the doctors is like sm smacking a little baby, and the other one, you know, a little thesoscope, and I put a mustache on one of them. They're real cute, <laughs> short, dark, and brown. <laughs> and the other one, interestingly enough, is married to a, a preschool teacher, and they like the little children ones. Mm -hmm. They like those, so I've saved those aside for them, and those are the ones. So they they understand me. They know me. They know me on very very deep levels. And so, well, I hope that answers your question. So, and I guess that was, that's how I'll close then. Okay. I encourage you, um, as artists, as uh, teachers, as professionals, as parents, right, as philosophers and poets in your own right, to follow your own heart regardless of its color, regardless of its race or creed, regardless of its age or gender, regardless of all the things that people seem to judge us for, which don't make a lot of sense, I encourage you to follow your dream, to be selfish about your dream, to make your mark and to make the impact on the world and on the community that's meant for you to do. Each one of us has a special gift and we have to realize that, we have to enjoy it, and we have to use it for good. And I encourage all of you to do that. And I hope that Make Them All Mexican has made you laugh and think a little more deeply about the idea of judging each other on superficial values that have no place at all in uh, the community of humanity. Thank you.
Oh, oh, before I forget, I made homemade ceviche. Oh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs>